Fitness. Uh, we know her. We know her as Dreesy, and she is the Assistant Director of Internal Leadership Development at CSU. And Dreesy primarily provides leadership development to faculty and staff here on campus. And on occasion, she joins us for external programming, uh, such as today. She is certified in Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, MBTI, um, Emergenetics, as well as Right Path 360. Thomas completed her undergraduate and graduate studies here at Columbus State University. And with it being homecoming week, uh, this is a great speaker to have at this time. Uh, with that being said, I am going to turn it over to Dreesy. And again, we apologize for uh, the delayed start time. So Dreesy, you have the floor. Awesome. Thank you, Brianna. Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. I hope you're doing well. Um, as Brianna said, apologies for the late start. Technology, <laughs> technology. Um, and so I'm happy you all are here. I'm not sure if you all are able to chat. Brianna, are they able to uh, be in the chat or chat or unmute themselves and speak? Let me know if they are. You all should be able to. Okay, let's see. Okay, you all can chat, perfect. Um, so I love uh, to interact throughout my sessions. And so if you are able to um, chat, I see that you are. If you are able to unmute yourself and speak, please, please, please do that. I am continuing to admit people here. I'm letting more people in. But before we get started, I just wanted to share that with you all um, so that you all will be interacting and chatting with me um, throughout this time, okay? Now, are you all able to unmute yourselves and speak? Let me know that before we officially get started. Let's see. Okay, no. So just chat. Perfect. All right, you all. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for that. Um, and so today we're talking all about relational intelligence. So when you all hear relational intelligence, place a few words in the chat about what comes to your mind. When you hear relational intelligence, what comes to your mind? And I'll be on the lookout for your chat responses. Ernie says being able to connect with people. Melissa says listening. Awesome. Those are two great ones. Thank you for sharing. I'll see if we have anybody else coming in in the chat. Okay, so these are two good ones. A uh, joy says people skills. That's exactly right. Thank you for that joy. Latricia says, communicating with and understanding different personalities. Rochelle says, getting to know people. Rebecca says, interpersonal relationship skills. Awesome, awesome. So you, are, you all are saying some great things there. So I want you to consider, um, whether it's right now or whether it's been in the past, um, any kind of situation that you've been in, any kind of relationship challenge that you've been in, and if it's a present one, I want to invite you to write that down. If it's a certain situation, if it's a particular individual, I want you to just jot it down. In fact, if you don't have a sheet of paper next to you, you can just kind of jot it in your phone, right, or, or write something, uh, write it on a piece of paper um, if you do have a piece of paper next to you because we're gonna come back to that at the end, okay? So if you find yourself in any kind of relational struggle, relational challenge, um, again, whether it's a situation or whether it's an individual, I just want you to jot it down and make a note of it, okay? And we're going to come back around to that in a second. So I wanna share with you all um, what our objectives will be for today. And so here you'll be able to see that in this session, what we're gonna be doing today is you're gonna gain knowledge on the meaning and importance of relational intelligence. And you're gonna understand how the past plays a role in the present 
and you're going to discover tips that hopefully will allow you to increase skills in relational interest. And so, you know, we all need people skills to succeed, but many people, we may not know how we are able to do it, right? And for some, it comes easier to us than others, okay? So if you think about things like DISC or Myers-Briggs that really show us our personality preferences or our differences, you know that some people may be more so task oriented, some people more so, uh, may be more so people oriented. And so even with those two differences, you can see how relational intelligence can come easy for some and then how it can maybe be more of a challenge to others. And so I want you to go into this knowing that maybe what comes easy to you may not come as easy to others. And so hopefully that phrase right there already will allow us to give other people grace in whatever situation we find ourselves in now or whatever situation um, may come up <laughs> because it is a part of life, okay? So you all have heard of IQ, you all have heard of EQ, but today we're going to be talking about, I like to say the new kid on the block. I wouldn't, uh, maybe it's not the newest kid on the block, but I guess it's the, one of the latest buzzwords on the block, which is RQ. Okay, so we've heard of IQ, we've heard of EQ. Now it's going to uh, be all about um, RQ on today. So let's get into it. I'm going to share um, a little bit about relationships today, okay? So as you all know, we are in year 2023, okay? We are in year 2023, and a lot has changed with us being in year 2023, okay? So earlier generations focused a lot about um, liberation uh, and, and different things like that. Maybe it was respect, maybe it was order, maybe it was control. If we were to look at past generations and what they what was important to them relationally and when they were connecting to other people, we would realize that it looks a little different than it does today. And so today, we're all, if you really take note of it and if you really pay attention to kind of what's been going on, not even just this year, but the last few years, few years, this latest generation, and maybe not even this generation, but where we are in today's society, it's all about um, violations. And when I say violations, I want you to think about words such as boundaries, um, consent, um, self-protection. If you think about where we are today, where, we, where we've kind of been in society the last few years, those are the words we've been hearing. That boundary word is a huge one. We've been hearing a lot about boundaries. And so uh, we have to start with where we are today, year 2023, and these last few years to really understand, um, you know, what we are deeming as good relationships, what we are deeming as quote unquote bad relationships. And so all of this can be uh, roped into this idea of how we handle disagreements, right? How we wanna connect with each other on an interpersonal level. Um, I think all of this, what has happened the last few years and this year have even allowed some people to wanna to desire a, a greater level of clarity. They wanna understand someone who is different than them. But at the same time, you know, all of this boundary control and all of this has also caused maybe some conflict. So there's a lot of conflict here. Then there's a lot of people seeking to desire clarity. And so when we think about relationships in today's world, that's where we are. If we consider to look at um, relationships, whether this is professionally you all, or whether this is personally, we can also see that there is a rise in expectations. So even in today's workplace, we are hearing words that we typically didn't hear years prior um, or even generations prior. So even in the workplace, you're hearing words such as vulnerability. You're hearing words such as transparency. You're hearing words such as authenticity, trust, belonging. You didn't quite hear these words years prior, but these are some of the words that are very important um, in today's uh, world. And it's really interesting because it's not just important in today's world and in today's society, but it's important in the job space. So much so 
that if you think about relational skills and how it's been uh, connected to soft skills, you will always hear building soft skills or um, learning how to strengthen your soft skills. Relationship building and these words such as vulnerability and trust and transparency that we're really hearing nowadays, um, we're starting to see this idea of relational intelligence moving more into actually a technical skill versus a soft skill. So that's how important this idea of boundaries and relationships and vulnerability and transparency and trust, all of these words we've been hearing for the last few years, hopefully that goes to show you how important and how much of a priority it has become um, these last few um, years. Let's see, let me look at this note here. Okay, got it, got it. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I want you all to consider where we are relationally in today's society. And I want you to kind of put some stuff in the chat. Where do you think that we are now in today's society versus where we were previously? So I shared a few things with you all, like this idea of a violation is very important. This idea of making sure, or I should say, making sure you're not violated. Therefore, you hear words such as boundaries and um, and then also these words in the workplace and outside of the workplace, such as vulnerability or transparency, all of these new things that we're finding in this area of relationships, what would you say are some of the new things or the new themes that you have uh, observed when it comes to relationships in today's world? I'll give you all a few minutes to place that in the And I will read this out once everybody is done. All right, I see your responses coming in. Thank you for those. I'm going to read some of these out. Give y'all a few more minutes. Give y'all a few more minutes. And while we're waiting for some people to uh, comment, I will definitely hop in with what I have been noticing when it comes to relationships. So someone said real, and that sparked um, uh, my thinking. So when it comes to relationships, I value transparency. Um, if you just tell me how it is, um, I will value the relationship more. Um, so those are my thoughts, Tracy, on the concept okay. of what comes to mind with relationships. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm going to read some of these that we have in the chat here. So Brianna mentioned transparency. Ernie says more relationships, but shallow. Only what is shared on social media. Um, that's a good one, Ernie. It makes me think about um, one of the takeaways um, where it mentioned that we have switched our lives and societies from structure to network. And with that idea of network, it was saying that it's much more loose and a lot more freedom. So I wonder, because it is much more loose, um, maybe that also, of course, yes, social media and the times that we're in, but maybe just the the, the structure change of it all has also kind of looped into uh, the, the piece where it, it may become shallow. Um, Marsha says respect. Brianna says honesty and vulnerability comes to mind when thinking about relationships. Carla says it seems you have to uh, tread a lot more carefully. 
Um, yeah, a lot of people have, uh, have, have mentioned, like, I don't know what I can say. I don't know what I can't say. So then a lot of people don't say anything at all. And I think we all know that silence is not the best when we're, you know, when we're trying to build relationships and things like that. So Carla, that's a very good point there. That treading carefully can, can really hinder um, that relationship growth. Yvette says, common courtesy and respect. Morgan, not setting standards based upon your relationship title. Yvette also says respect. Katrina says very few real relationships in these modern times. So there goes that piece of uh, the authenticity of relationships or what someone mentioned previously, like it's very much so shallow or a lot of people see them as shallow. Joy says since COVID, we learned to use virtual communication for meetings and lacked face-to-face -face contact. Yes. So COVID played a role in relational, in relational intelligence overall, in relationships overall. Rhonda says, a lack of ability to compromise, hard line stance, not seeing the person, but making assumptions. That's a good one. Yvette says, personal relationship. Nikki says, respect and honesty. Emily says, texting and emails make it more difficult. Melissa says, uh, maybe more transparency, but less honesty and less genuine. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Clarity of what the relationship is or isn't. Yep, that's a good one. Um, generational perspective of what a relationship means. So what does a relationship even mean? That's a good one. Thank you all for sharing. And I just read out a few of those. We're going to keep it going. So what you'll see is these next three slides, I'm going to share with you all three different quotes, okay? These are quotes from people who have actually done some research or wrote a book or have done a, a TED talk of some sort on uh, relational intelligence. And so I want you to take a good look and listen uh, to the quotes that I'm gonna read out to you all. And I want you to just think about and consider which one speaks to you the most, okay? which one speaks to you the most and why. Um, and of course, as you're doing that, you can start just putting it in the chat as we're going through each one of these. So again, it'll be three. There will be three quotes. And here's the first one. Let's see here. It says here, the quality of our relationships determines the quality of our lives. So the quality of our relationships determines the quality of our lives. That's the first one. The second one says, the greatest gifts walk into your life on two legs. And the quote before was from someone, and I saw. I know you saw her picture, but her name is Esther Perel. I may be pronouncing her wrong, uh, her name slightly incorrectly, but Esther Perel, um, and she is a Belgian American psychotherapist. She is one of uh, a few people who have coined this term of relational intelligence. So if you are um, interested in learning more about this topic, I would say definitely take a look at Esther Perel who was the first quote, and Darius Daniels here, who is the second quote. He has written a book on relational intelligence. He's a speaker, he's a coach. Um, and so those two would be very great. Um, it is, it's top notch. It really is, would be a good two people to take a look at if you're really wanting to do a deeper dive into relational intelligence. So this is our second quote, you all. The greatest gifts walk into your life on two legs, okay? And then our third quote, I'm sure if you're in the leadership development world or have done some leadership development training at any point that you have heard of John C. Maxwell. He says here that relational skills are the most important abilities in leadership. Relational skills are the most important of abilities in leadership. So I want you to consider which of those three quotes speak to you the most? You could simply say one, two, and three in the chat um, and just kind of uh, type up why, okay? Kind of type why. For me, Dreesy, I believe it was that first one. That first mm -hmm. one was really good because I, 
it's some truth to that. You know, the quality of life that you lead is based on the people who you have in your life, the people who are pouring into you through that relationship. So mm -hmm. for me, uh, that one by Esther was was really stellar. And seeing the chat, I see a lot of ones. So that oh, one spoke to some people. Okay, awesome. And you know, when we think about the quality of life, I don't know if a lot of people's mindset directly goes to like the, the relational area, but it's so, so very important. And as human beings, we deserve a quality life in all areas. Um, and so, you know, our relationships play a huge role in our overall quality of life. Um, and so let's see, I am seeing a lot of ones. Great. Okay. I see someone said one and three, one and three. Okay, good, 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 good. And so you'll see even from these quotes that relationships are important, okay? And we should not discount their power. So hopefully some of you all will walk away just at, you know, reminding yourself, okay, oh my gosh, relationships really do have, maybe they have more power than I was considering them to have. So um, really remember that uh, the power of relationships and the fact that, you know, our makeup as human beings, we weren't created to be lone wolf at all, okay? And so it's a part of our, our upbringing. It's a, it's a part of our makeup. And if we go back into like early, early times, uh, when human beings were formed, one thing that you saw was communities and you saw tribes and you saw groups. And so that should tell us the beginning of human beings, the beginning of humans on this earth and how that makeup was uh, very much so of a tribe nature and a group nature should tell us the, uh, the power and the importance that relationships should have um, in our lives. And I do want to bring up something, Dreesy, that Ernie okay. said, as well as okay. reiterate Elizabeth's uh, comment. You have to have people around you who disagree. Um, so these Absolutely. relationships, and sorry if I'm jumping ahead, Dreesy, but no, you're you fine. Know, all of your relationships, uh, they shouldn't be uh, filled with, your circle shouldn't be filled with yes people. Um, and so I just recently wrote a blog on that, that I'll make sure I drop into the chat. Um, but <laughs> what Ernie said, make sure you have some people who you don't necessarily agree with on certain things. And Absolutely. then Elizabeth says here, if you have supporting people in your life, you will be happy and better at what you do in life. If you don't have supportive people in your life, you will be unhappy and always be miserable at what you do. That's good. That's good. Um, and it made me think of something I recently saw on, on uh, social media where it was saying like a real friend will tell you the truth. A fake friend will tell you what you want to hear. Um, and so you need you need that supportive crew, but you also need the crew that's going to challenge you. Um, and this just made me think of another thing. I think I posted it. If we're talking about leadership, right? Because that's what we do here at the Leadership Institute. When we're talking about leadership, I saw a post that said, hey, an insecure leader is going to want yes men around them. An effective leader is going to want people around them who's going to challenge them. And so hopefully that gets our wheels turning in terms of like, okay, who do I have around me? Are they always going to say yes to me? Are they always going to tell me I'm right? If that's the case, maybe taking a look and, and, and saying, hmm, do I have any challengers in my circle? Do I have any challengers in my group? Um, that matters as well. That matters as well. I'm just going to read a few of these because um, you, you, you all are saying some great things here. So let's see. We read Ernie's. Cindy says three, because if you don't have a relationship with others, it is hard to understand them and be able to assist in their need. It is also helpful so you're able to know what task that person might do well with. Awesome. Brenda said they're all important to her for different situations. Awesome. Melissa says, number three, important to her because she feels that our main focus as leaders is helping people become what they want to be and achieve what they want to achieve. We can't do that if we don't have the ability to listen and learn from them. Very good. Awesome. 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 So thank you all for sharing. Um, 
Thank you all for sharing. And it's okay to agree to disagree. It really is. And I don't know if we really know that in today's world. I don't know if we really, we, we use the term so much, but I don't know if we really have, have we really believe that it's okay to disagree. You know, um, I think that's something as a society, in my opinion, that maybe we could work on. Maybe we could grow in. So these were our three quotes here. Um, and so now I want to get into the definitions, okay? The definitions of relational intelligence. Anytime I'm given a definition about anything, I always want people to know like, hey, this definition is not the end all be all. Um, we could totally go on Google and type in relational intelligence and find tons of definitions. And so I never want anybody to think like, oh, this is the only one, let's stick to this one, no. As this word is becoming more of a buzzword, as this topic is becoming more popular, I am totally sure that uh, more definitions will arise, okay? So here's the first one. Um, and I want you to take note of this one because this is gonna come back up towards the end in a few more minutes. So this one says relational intelligence, um, for sure it's RQ, is the ability to discern if someone should be part of our lives and what place they should occupy and then align them accordingly, okay? So it's the ability to discern if someone should be a part of our lives, number one, and then what place they should occupy, number two, and then align them accordingly. Now, this could be personally and this could be professionally. So I want you to try to have on both of your hats. You know, if you're thinking personally, I want you to think personally. If you're thinking professionally, I want you to think professionally. And a lot of the times here at the Leadership Institute, we always say, hey, take a holistic approach. I even say that when I'm working internally with faculty and staff. I know we're at work. I know we may be talking about various topics that pertain to our jobs and our day-to-day -day tasks on our jobs. But I also want you to walk away, hopefully, with items that can help you in your professional life as well. Um, so I'm inviting you all to do that um, today within this session as well. So let's think how this could apply in leadership. This could be hiring the right team member. Um, this could be placing the right team member to do specific tasks. This may also include letting go of a team member, um, managing your team, um, interacting with your, your colleagues. So again, this doesn't just have to align uh, personally, but it can, it can really tie into what we do professionally as well, okay? I'm going to share another one with you. So this is the one by Darius Daniels. Remember, he was one of the people who um, uh, quoted one of our, our, our former quotes or one of our three quotes. Now, our next one is from Esther, um, and she's also another one. So those are the two names if you're wanting to dig deeper um, that, again, I, I do want you to look them up. But she says relational intelligence um, is defined as the ability to connect with others within the workplace and to establish mutual trust. It's the ability to connect with people to help establish boundaries, understand an individual's work habits, and learn how to deal with disagreements and violations of trust. So remember that previous slide where I mentioned it said 2023 in big red numbers. You probably heard where we were talking about how today there's this focus on violations. And so with this focus of violations, you see words such as boundaries come up. You see words such as trust coming up. You see words um, such as, um, you know, connection coming up or that mutual trust coming up. Uh, and so you even see that in this definition here. Um, so that just brings the point back around that now we're seeing a lot of, of, of word, word usage, such as mutual trust and establish, um, establishing those boundaries and really looking at, people are really looking at how they feel as though they're, they're being violated and what that means in, in relationships. So you see that here um, in this definition. And this is one thing that we have to remember about relationships. Uh, it, it really, one of the things about relationships is that it's not one person. So one of the things that's, that we need to walk away with today is the fact that relationships are complementarity. And so what that means is they're complementary. Um, and so it's the state of, what I just mentioned is the state of being complementary. 
And so we have to understand that two people are going to bring two different things to the table. We can be talking professionally, we can be talking uh, personally. And so a lot of times as human beings, we can think that the way in which we're doing something is the proper way, is the best way, is the only way. And so when I say that relationships are complementary, it's that also that ability, we see here is the ability to connect, but a part of that ability to connect is to understand that, hey, maybe I'm only bringing one piece of the puzzle to the table and I need to be open enough to make sure that I am connecting with everybody here who's at the table so that I have the ability to bring their puzzle piece into this space as well. And so that's where a lot of conflict can come in where you're only looking at your piece. Um, and so that can be in work, right? Maybe someone is always looking at the details and then you have another person who's always looking at the big picture where you need both. You need that person who can always look at the big picture and you need that person who can really pay attention to those details. We don't need one without the other. And so hopefully that gives a, a good idea of um, the fact of uh, that relationship should really keep that, you know, that, that complementary idea in mind um, as you're navigating with people. I think when you do that, when you walk in relationships with that mindset, it will establish that mutual trust. Mm -hmm. And as and we all know, up. trust is the foundation for a lot of things. And if you haven't seen Leading at the Speed of Trust, that was a webinar we had with Jason Somerville. And what Dreesy is saying right now, it definitely reminds me of that bank of trust. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, review, if you've seen that webinar, as Jason was saying, you have to have an equal balance of withdrawals mm -hmm. and deposits. So yep. making sure that you have both things in the relationship. So that was mm -hmm. good, Dreesy. Awesome. And it makes me uh, think of the fact that relationships are a dance. I want you to think of it as a dance, right? Um, and, and, these, and I like to talk a lot in, in my programs here at CSU about these micro moves. Relationships also incorporate micro moves. And so whether it's these large grandiose movements or these small um, acts of kindness or or small moments of communication, know that all of those moments uh, really add in um, and can enhance and affect the relationship, whether good or bad. And so we want to uh, keep in mind that the dance is continuing. Um, and, and you know, whether we're taking small steps or big steps, the more that we navigate through this, um, we'll know, you know uh, how to be effective as we're, as we're doing this dance, okay? So another thing I want um, us to, to walk away with is this understanding that when we think about RQ, of course, some people may be thinking about, oh, okay, well, what about EQ and what about IQ and are they related? They absolutely are. And so uh, I want you all to look at this layout here that says IQ, which is our intellectual capacity or our ability to reason, plus EQ, um, emotional intelligence or emotional capacity, equals our RQ or our relational intelligence. So when we think about emotional intelligence, um, that is the focus of our ability to control our emotions, our ability to interact with other people, um, and, and maybe navigating and observing their emotions as well. IQ is our ability to reason. If we you know, are pretty decent and pretty solid, pretty healthy in the IQ and the EQ area, it's a high probability that our RQ is probably gonna be uh, in, in a healthy area as well. Um, but if you find, if you sat in an emotional intelligence um, sessions and you find that, ooh, there are certain quadrants in the emotional intelligence world that I can work on, take note of that because that could be connected to your relational intelligence and it could uh, maybe show you some areas that you can improve on or it can show you some areas that 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 are strengths for you as well. So th they're all connected. They are all connected, but I want you to be able to differentiate between the two. So emotional intelligence and, and relational intelligence aren't the same thing. Again, emotional intelligence is your ability to manage your emotions, to observe and take note of other people's emotions how you are uh, interpersonally as well. Relational intelligence is your ability to connect. Okay, it's your ability to connect and your ability to stay connected. It's your ability to connect and your ability to, to stay connected. 
and, and remember is in to discern who should be where. Okay. So they're all related, but they're all not the same thing. So hopefully this helped you all kind of differentiate and see, um, you know, how they each play a role and how the IQ, EQ, and RQ are related. Before we hop into the next slide, did we have any questions? Um, I don't see any questions in the chat right now, Dreesy. I just okay. dropped some resources um, there. So if you all want to look at those later, please save. But no questions right now, Dreesy. Okay, perfect. I'm reading Melissa's comment. She says, I don't think most people understand that it's okay for others to disagree with them. Yes, we don't have a problem justifying when we offer the disagreement, but have a serious problem when we are the ones disagreed with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it makes me, your, your comment actually makes me think about one of the things that we discuss in our conflict resolution session, um, where when I'm really breaking down like the foundation in the beginning of that session, it talks a lot about the idea that conflict is not bad. But, in, you know, for a lot of people, if they see conflict, if they sense conflict, if they hear conflict, they may think negative, bad, no. And so we really have to differentiate the fact that, hey, there is a such thing as positive and healthy conflict, which means that teams should be able to come together and debate. Family members should be able to come together and have conversations and know that it's okay that we can agree to disagree. Um, there should be healthy and positive conflict. There should be healthy disagreement in relationships. That is normal. But I think we don't see that as normal. We see it as bad and no, and everybody should agree and sing kumbaya. But the 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 reality of the situation is that you need that positive and healthy conflict in the midst. Mm -hmm. And a way to look at that is just as Melissa said, healthy conflicts, it's a way to uh, resolve issues. Those That is how issues are resolved through healthy conflict. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not easy for everybody. And this this walks me straight into our next slide. So that was actually a good transition. It's not easy for everybody. And the reason that it's not easy for everybody is that we all have had different experiences in life from childhood to now. And that plays a role in how we approach relationships. And of course, under the umbrella of relationships is conflict and is disagreement. If you look back at Esther Perel's definition of, of relational intelligence that I shared, that last line was said a little bit about the ability to, to really engage in disagreement. That's a part of relational intelligence. Um, and so our past, our experiences, our upbringings play a role in how we are today in our relationships. So I want us to take a trip back down memory lane. I want you to take a note, mental note of your relationship resume or your relationship legacy. And I want you to consider maybe what were you taught growing up uh, in terms of relationships and, and, and really look at how it plays a crucial role and how you navigate them today. I'm going to read out a few things to you that can get your wheels spinning. So at a young age, we learn uh, the following. We learn our relationships important. In what way? Should you look out? Should you be suspicious? Should you trust many people? Should you always make sure someone is behind you? Um, should someone always have your back? Um, were you told that you were not alone? So I want you to consider what were you taught? What were you told? Um, and because that really allows us to, to see, okay, maybe this is why I show up in relationships now. So if you feel comfortable, let me have some of you kind of think back and put in the chat what you were told or taught growing up as it pertains to relationships and where you see that coming up in your relationships today. Um, and some more questions would be, will you race for autonomy or loyalty? Will you race for self-reliance? or race for interdependence? Were you taught to trust or were you taught to distrust? So all of these things that we were told and taught or that we heard or even that we saw growing up and in various life experiences, they do play a role in how we show up today in our relationships. And I think the last thing you said, Dracy, how, what we saw. So for me, what came mm -hmm. to mind were visual things. Mm -hmm. um, my mom has a bleeding heart. If you've ever heard that term, that's just someone 
who who goes above and beyond to care for others, to mm -hmm. to pour into others. And that was my visual of what relationships were grow, growing up. Now, there are some <laughs> pros and cons now that I am an adult and, and yeah. going through life that um, I now experience with seeing my mom pour so much and give, give, give into others. Yeah. Um, I, that's how I interact in my relationships today. I do a lot of of pouring. Um, yeah. But it's also important, like you said, Dreesy, to have some balance. So that, you know, helps this whole conversation. It helps me to, to reevaluate um, mm -hmm. the, the role I'm playing in my relationships. And we yeah. did have two comments in the chat. Um, yeah. One from Brenda, the way we think about or operate in relationships can be impacted by cultural culture as mm -hmm. well. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's true. Greta, personal experience inform relational approaches. So if we invest the time in understanding that others' experiences and outcomes may be different than our own, it will increase our ability to relate intelligently. Great yes. words, Miss Awesome, Evan. Greta. Yeah, that is so true. Let's see. I see one by... Melissa, that says, what I learned is to be funny. Making people laugh can diffuse the situation. I've had to get past that. I was maybe unintentionally taught that conflict is bad, so avoid it at all costs. Well, that's a good one, Melissa. Um, I've had a lot to learn. So you've used humor, you, you would use humor um, to kind of take the space of, of, of maybe healthy conflict in a way. Daryl said, I was told to always watch your back. Ooh, okay. That's a good one. Let's see. Um, Ernie says, my father frequently said, if you have five friends who you can truly count on in many circumstances, you are a rich man. Uh-huh. My mother earned her value uh, by surrounding herself with people, dozens of friends, many of whom disappeared when she was struggling. Okay, this is good. Latricia says, um, let me scroll back up to yours. We were taught to be nice to others, but only trust family. As an adult, I realized that a wall was built and that only allowed people to get so close. That's a good one. Thank you for sharing. Thank you all for being open and sharing this. Um, let's see. Carmen says, my parents instilled in me the golden rule. Treat others the way that you like to be treated and always have respect for your elders. Great. Good, good. So hopefully you're able to just kind of take a walk down memory lane, look at your relationship resume, look at the, your relationship legacy and ask yourself some of those questions. What did I see? What did I hear? What was I told growing up that plays a role in how I show up today in my relationships? Um, I think we cannot have a healthy level of relational intelligence without going back and, and, and saying, OK, let me start from point one. Let me start from point A. Let me go to my childhood. Let me go to my life experiences and see, um, you know, what was a theme back then or what I was told, what I was taught, what were some, you know, what I saw over and over again. What did I hear over and over again? Um, although we think it's years and years down the line, it still plays a role in how we show up. So, again, I want you to think about these questions uh, that I read out to you all. Um, and, and, and really kind of marinate on how you show up. So it says, do you race for auto autonomy or do you race for uh, self-reliance? Um, do you race for loyalty and interdependence? So some people may be more self-reliant. Some people may be more interdependent. Okay, some people uh, may be on the autonomy side. Some people more may be more so on the loyalty on the yeah on the loyalty side. Um, yeah, Brenda says autonomy. So you know, be thinking of maybe which side you you tend to lean on. And for some of us, maybe we need to work on more of the um, self reliance piece. Maybe you bend a little bit more towards the interdependent piece, right? Some of us need to bend a little bit more toward, towards the interdependent piece because we are, you know, too, too self-reliant. And so depending on which one you, you normally gravitate to, you want to make sure that if you're leaning, that you can try to start kind of straighten your, straightening yourself out a tad. 
if that makes sense. Carla says loyalty. So every person will be different in how they answer those questions, okay? So as we are rounding out our conversation today, I want us to look at four relationship categories, okay? Four relationship categories. And so you see here that there are four areas that people can, can fit into, okay? If we, if we wanna categorize people. So one area would be friends, okay? Friends, this is someone who would get access to you in intimate ways. So maybe that would be time, maybe that would be information. Okay, then we have associates. This is a person with whom you have periodic or consistent association. Associates can be confused with friends a lot of times. Then you have assignments. So these can be people that you're training, that you're mentoring, that you're advising, those you're providing, uh, that you're providing mentorship, guidance, training, and or coaching to. And then advisors, okay? Advisors uh, share their experiences or their education or their exposure to others. So these could be the trainers and the mentors, okay? So remember that one of the definitions I shared with you all a few minutes ago, it said you should know what place that people occupy and then align them accordingly. So a part of knowing what space and what place people occupy is knowing the categories, right? How should I categorize uh uh, these people. And professionally, this could be, you know, associates, this could be direct reports, this could also be mentees and mentors. So don't feel like you have to just stick in these stick to the box or stick to the words that I've shared with you all on this screen. If you start thinking of other categories, feel free to, uh, you know, jot those down or keep those in mind as well. So with these categories in mind, I want you all to consider the following, okay? This can even be something that you do post this session. It doesn't have to be right now, but I want you to create four boxes and title each one. You'll see those four boxes to the right there. I want you to title each box friends, associates, assignments, and or advisors, or the titles maybe that work better for you if you feel like other categories would work better for you. And then it's it's really good if you ever need to check in with yourself um, and, and see how you're doing in the relationship world. Um, if you have everybody aligned where they need to be, remember that this is a part of relational intelligence is being able to place people in the right spaces and places. And so then after you create those four boxes, take a moment to list the names of individuals under the categories that reflect where they currently exist in your life, okay? So you're gonna take a moment to list out the names, put specific names in each box as they pertain to where you feel like they currently exist in your life. Then you're gonna place a check mark by a name that is listed in the proper category. And then you're gonna place an M, which means for move, it means move by a name that may need to move to another category, okay? so. This can be your relational, a portion of, I should say, your relational intelligence check-ins or some tips that you can walk away with today is do I have the right people in the right places? Do I have the right people in the right places? Yep, learn the difference between friends and acquaintances. Yep, which will be that friends and associates piece. Remember in the previous slide, it said that associates can oftentimes be confused as friends. Brenda says she operates in all of these. The first two fits her personal and the next two fit your professional. Great. She says, although I also support some folks in my personal with the professional part. Awesome. And that's gonna look different for each of us, okay? That's gonna look different for each of us. So don't feel like yours needs to look or sound a certain way as compared to somebody else's. Be free for your box of four to look how it should look for you, okay? So I want you to keep that in mind. This Again, this is a tip or an activity or something you can walk away with that can help you with your relational intelligence, um, making sure that the right people are in the right places and spaces. Um, 
in Collins. It's a popular one. But he, one of the things he says, and this is directly related to the definition that I shared with you all a few slides ago, he said that we need, we need the right people on our bus, but we need them in the right seats. So he's really hitting directly on that, that first definition that I shared with you all. And again, this is the popular book, From Good to Great by Jim Collins. So he's like, you want the right people on the bus, but you got to have these right people in the right seats. Okay. And that book was all about going from good to great. So that tells you alone how relational intelligence plays a role in you going from good to great as well. Let's see, I see some, some, some chats in here. Tiffany says, I like how you included that associates can be those people who we have periodic or consistent interactions with. Yes, because I think we sometimes get friends and associates confused because of the longevity of the relationship. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, we have touched a little bit on, um, you know, as we're wrapping this up, I do want to hit something. I don't want y'all to walk away without what I'm about to share with you all, which is this idea of a relationship impasse. Okay. And so when we think of the word impasse, it pretty much, thank you, Bree. Yep. She put the book in there. I know many of you have probably read it, but if you haven't, there it is. It says, good to great, why some companies make the leap and others don't. Um, so relationship impasse, when we think about the word impasse, it means no progress, disagreement, or deadlock. Um, again, we should be shifting our, our minds on what we think about disagreements because we're human in this life and in relationships, they're going to come up. Um, it's normal, um, <laughs> but I don't think we like, well, many people don't like it when it pops up. But there's this cycle that, that Esther Perel talks about where she says relationships are harmony, disharmony, repair, harmony, disharmony, repair. And then she said it's also connection, disconnection, reconnection, connection, disconnection, reconnection. And she said that it's actually in those reconnection moments that that true trust is built but we don't think about it all of the time. So this slide kind of hits on what we were just talking about with that, having that comfort level of being okay to disagree or being okay to navigate through conflict when you, when you need to, because it's a part of relationships. And this cycle is this cycle that we're going to see in relationships, harmony, disharmony, repair, connection, disconnection, reconnection. Um, and I wanna share a few things that she said can be typically hidden. In relationships. So the first thing she said that can be typically hidden, if you find yourself in any of these impasses or these cycles, she said power and control is one of those things that can be hidden. She said, who has the power, whose priorities matter, and who's going to make the decision? That's one of the things that can be hidden in a relationship. She also compare in the closeness, and i.e. the trust. Does this person have my back? Do I feel that they care about me? Are we in this together? Those are some of those underlying things or feelings or thoughts that can be hidden. And then last but not least, re respect and recognition. Am I valued? Do I matter? Um, you know, we are creatures of meaning, believe it or not. As human beings, we are creatures of meaning. And so those are some of the things that if they're not being said, it's like one of those things that are underlying and hidden. Um, but again, it's in that reconnection moment that that true trust is built. And so if you find yourself in a relationship impasse, and this kind of goes directly to the, the question I asked you all at the beginning, like, hey, if, you are, if you're in a certain situation with a certain person, write that down. I want you to consider, um, you know, what are some things that, or it, one, if you feel like you're in an impasse, and then how can you shift or maybe navigate how you're thinking about it, whether it's a conflict, whether it's a disagreement, and maybe how you can better navigate through, um, you know, what, what it is that you all need to do to get past that impasse. Um, and again, our lens, like what I talked about, how we think about a thing really matters. So um, I, as we close, I'm gonna share one more thing with you all. Um, and it's this idea of how we view situations. So let's let's say that someone, uh, let's say that two people are late and the first person says, well, I was late because of traffic, but that person was late because they're a slob. Um, so it, we really think that 
we're other people are simple and we're complex that's a lot of times how we think in our head so it's like oh yeah it was it was the traffic for me but for the other person it, it, they're a slob um and so that can even be what's called an attribution error what we are attributing things to and that is so important in relationships especially if you find yourself in a relationship impasse especially if you find yourself in a disagreement of some sort um what are we attributing things to and so a lot of times we can have that attribution error going, which is actually um, an unconscious bias, what we attribute things to. And so just be thinking if you're ever uh, hitting a relationship impasse, what is getting in the way? Is it how you're seeing a situation? Is it how you're attributing something um, or a characteristic or a quality to a person um, that our perspective matters in relationships as well? Okay. And so as we're closing out, I'll, I'll uh, show you all the good to great, what I just uh, reminded you of not too long ago. And Brianna did put that book in the chat, but it says, get the right people on the bus, get the wrong people off the bus, put who before what, and get the right people in the right seats. That is all connected to um, relational intelligence, okay? And so I hope that you were able to take away some good info from today's session. Um, I believe, yep, we're right after 12, so I don't want to hold you any longer unless somebody has any questions. Yep, so the two names were Esther Perel and the other name was Darius Daniels. Okay, Esther Perel and Darius Daniels. Thank you so much for today, Dreesy. This was an awesome topic. Um, thank you all for joining us. I will wrap us up very quickly. Our next webinar will be November the 30th, and it's all about talent strategies. So taking everything that we learned throughout uh, this series and applying it to the people who we lead, developing our talent. Um, so that's going to be on November the 30th. If you would like a copy of this presentation, as well as a link to the recording, please go ahead and drop your email addresses in the chat. If you have any um, topic recommendations or um, information that you want us to touch base on in our 2024 series, um, please feel free to email us at Leadership Institute at columbusstate.edu, Leadership Institute at columbusstate.edu. And thank you all for joining us. We'll see you all soon. Thank you. I'm just saving this.